start recording okay chapter 5 CPU scheduling we have done processes and threads all right and uh, there are a couple of questions with the threads and processes when we start any process or thread how it's gonna be scheduled the problem with that you know we have many processes and the, the actually the idea behind all of this stuff is utilizing the CPU 100 percent at all times you, you, you're gonna make it busy all the time because you want all your stuff run all the applications run on time some applications are real time some of them are uh, user intensive you know you have some foreground processes you have a website maybe you have a server all the applications all the service systems services everything should run on time we don't want to wait that is why we want to keep the CPU busy for example if you have multiple processes and they go into the CPU in turn right and we were saying that there are two things very important for us CPU burst and the uh, IO burst you know when there's a process trying to read from a CD from a hard drive or from memory you know all these stuff all the storage types including the memory dynamic RAM they're all slower than CPU no matter how fast they are in the uh, you know using the technology today they're always slower CPU is a gigahertz 3 4 gigahertz but the fastest uh, DRAM memory you can have is today how many megahertz it's not even a gigahertz is it as far as I remember anyway so the idea CPU is the fastest device the item in your motherboard and the operating system is responsible to manage all those stuff right including the memory the CPU I device and everything so there are a couple of processes in your CPU and one of them may let's say the first one uh, does some stuff calculations uses the CPU registers and ALU etc and then he want it, it wants to read from the hard drive and it says okay give me that file open this file from the hard drive at that specific time what happens the CPU just goes idle because it has to wait for the, the application itself needs to wait for the file right so it's a I request and you have to wait and then what do we do with the process uh, what is the state of the process now when we try to read from the hard drive it was in the running states previously and now it goes into some other state and you should remember it waiting state and when you set a process to waiting state what happens where do you put that process you take it from the uh, CPU and put somewhere else where do you put it back in the memory yes right uh, there's something called PCB process control block you just put it back in the memory into a queue right just not anywhere in the memory but into a queue but some this is short-term scheduling for the processes but there's another type you remember maybe long-term if you have too many processes and you don't have enough space in the memory the I mean the RAM memory what do you do you just put things some of the stuff into the hard drive in Linux what is it called that uh, swapping things there's actually a partition called swap right <laughs> anyways um, so the CPU needs to be busy all the time right and so we just put that process into a queue which is particularly an IO queue it's gonna wait for it from the previous chapter and then we're gonna pick another process since we're waiting for something we're gonna pick some other uh, another process from which one from where where do we get that new process the CPU must be always you know busy 
good question, isn't it? You know, this thing is pretty expensive, but not really functional. <laughs> Kind of better. We put it. Uh, we put pick that uh, particular process from the memory from the <laughs> ready queue. You know, we have multiple states for a process. On PCBs, we have waiting, terminated, ready, running. You know, so. Whatever we do, whenever the uh, CPU is not busy, we have to pick another one. What? I think I just messed up with the thingy. Oh, it's okay. The process has to be picked up from always the ready queue. This is number one you have to remember all the time. Whatever you do, if you're talking about CPU scheduling, you should always have to deal with the ready queue. You don't touch the waiting queue, you don't touch the terminated or running or whatever. Always deal with the ready queue, okay? And eventually processes will be in the ready queue all the time. <clears throat> what kind of processes we have, by the way? Let's say a user turns on the operating system and we have Windows, let's say, or Linux XP, doesn't matter, and doesn't run anything. Just sits there and looking into it. What's that? I cannot hear you. Should I do this here? Oh, let's move him outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we have a visitor. Anyways. If nothing is running, if user is not running any application, in that case, what kind of processes we have in the CPU? Is the CPU idle or doing something? Windows desktop, operating system, operating system itself. Operating system related system calls. You know, you see that screen on your display with Windows, beautiful Windows backgrounds and everything, and those are actually all of them are threads, they're processes and threads, right? They have to be running somewhere, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it, right? On the screen, you move your mouse, another process you're creating, your multiple threads you're creating. So there are actually two things you need to uh, take care. One is the system calls, the operating system itself, and the second one is the user-related stuff. You know, you, and also you can, uh, the user can, call make system calls like open a file you know run an application etc you know from reading from the network card reading from USB stick etc these are system calls too right I, I related stuff so they're mainly the operating system proce uh, processes and also user process and you know the difference between the user mode and the kernel mode right Okay, now we're gonna talk about CPU scheduling. What it really happens behind the scene when you have multiple processes waiting in the ready queue. How do you choose your processes? Before it was easy. You know, we were saying that, oh, we have multiple processes, we just put them in a queue, and then pick up from the queue, first in, first out, or F-I-L-L-O. Doesn't matter, whatever design you choose, you know, you just pick it from the queue. But it's not just like that because uh, we have to figure out a way to manage those stuff. You cannot just pick a uh, process from the queue and then run it until it finishes. Because sometimes you're going to have a large process with tons of CPU bursts. You will see about that later on. Those processes should not keep the CPU busy all the time because it's a real-time system. You know, the bottom line, you have a workstation or a server, multiple users are connected, or even it's a personal desktop computer, it doesn't matter, you might be running multiple things, right, at the same time. So you have to switch between the processes. You just can't uh, run one uh, particular process and wait until it finishes. 
you know, in general, we were saying that, oh, if there's an I/O request, then we can wait. In the meantime, we can switch to another process. What if there is no I/O request? Are you gonna go till the end? I'm not gonna wait like 10 minutes for one single process? No. We have some algorithms uh, for that reason. So, uh, we, again, the main purpose, the idea behind all this stuff, the C CPU scheduling, is trying to keep the uh, CPU busy all the time. We're going to talk about the basic concepts, scheduling criteria, you know, what are you looking for on a process, what, uh, what is the criteria to choose a different algorithm for each process or the same algorithm for all. Depends on the operating system and your application. Thread scheduling. You know, in op some operating systems, processes and threads are different things. You remember what was the difference between a process and thread? Come on. You know, thread is like, it's a process too, but it's, it, it's different in a way. What do you say? It's a string. It's a series of um, operations. Series of operations, smaller, right? Smaller pieces of processes, right? Small chunks of uh, programs. All right. Thread scheduling we're going to talk about. In Linux, for example, uh, processes and threads are the same thing. You know, they don't really differentiate between them. Why is that? It's up to them, you know, it's their design. The operating system is designed like you design a car, right? You just put your stuff together and then organize them together and then make it run, make it work. And then we're going to talk about SAMP stuff, uh, multiple processor scheduling with multiple uh, processors. Let me show you that. You already know that if you have an i5, i3, i7, or AMD, the latest CPUs, you have multi cores in it, right? And also, you might have multi core but multi CPU motherboards. You can put a multi core CPU right in here, in that slot, CPU slot. Let's say you have four cores in each CPU, that means you have. Can I just maximize that thing? Okay. On this specific motherboard, what is that? Oh, that guy. We have two processors. This is fairly an old one. Actually, it's about maybe five, six years old. I mean, it's not really a new one, but uh, it just gives the idea. So we have two processors here, each of them may have two or four cores or more, and then in total you're going to have 8, 10, in some systems uh, up to 32 uh, cores you might have. And actually Windows, the latest Windows uh, starting from the XP and Linux operating systems are supporting up to 256 cores as far as I remember, but you may go ahead and uh, research that area. So the, I chose this particular motherboard because as well as the CPUs here, it is like we have two separate motherboards here. If you look at the left ha hand side and right hand side, you will see similar structures, right? The CPU, the CPU, I got the bridge, I got the dynamic RAMs. So it will tell us something about the sp CPU scheduling later on, okay? So we have, two types. We might have multiple processors or we, uh, we might have multi-cores. Welcome. And we're going to talk about the algorithm. If you were the designer of an operating system, what would you do? Now at the end of this uh, today's uh, class, you're going to have <clears throat> really good idea about the algorithm types, algorithms to uh, choose the right CPU scheduling. Uh, how can you implement them, how can you test them, what are the ways to te test them, and which one it would be better for your operating system. Okay, we're going to talk about that. All right, the objectives, etc. We passed that. Okay. As I said, uh, the purpose of CPU scheduling, 
by the way, what is a CPU scheduling application? Is it, it's a part of the operating system, right? And it's a built-in application. It's a separate module, it's a separate application. When you turn on your computer after the BIOS the operating system is loaded up to the memory, which is called kernel, it runs all the time, right? And it's a part of that kernel, this uh, CPU scheduler, all right? By the way, when you have those uh, kernel applications running, as you know, you know, this motherboard is just a bunch of hardware, wires, silicon pieces, etc. right? What makes this thing smart is the operating system and the applications, right? When you run your operating system, when you start your operating system, all this memory management, hardware management, organizing, and CPU scheduling, and things like that, they're all running in the kernel. And actually the operating system controls itself how is it possible you just load that kernel and then load a couple of processes and threads on the cpu some of them are memory management related some of them uh, cpu schedulers some of them other you know hardware ios stuff they run all the time all right so this cpu scheduler uh, the algorithm, uh, algorithms we're going to talk about are applications, little applications, fast, super fast applications, right? It's running in the CPU all the time. No matter what application you're running as a user, it doesn't really matter. These things are running all the time. All right, just keep in mind that. And uh, there are two different burst types inside the CPU. CPU uh, burst and IO burst. Okay, CPU burst is uh, when you're running a application and process or a thread doesn't matter. It's running something which is very CPU sensitive. You're using a lot of CPU cycles. Are you uh, utilizing that ALU inside the CPU? Utilizing all the registers and all the stuff you're doing is making the CPU busy. It is called CPU burst. You know, it's using the CPU a lot that means and the other thing is IO burst if uh, somewhere in your instructions in the you know in the Java application you have lines some of them will say I need to read from the memory this and that and this and that and uh, one after the other there's a lot of IO requests and that is called IO burst all right all of a sudden you're trying to read a lot of stuff from somewhere from a USB stick, from a you know a, any I/O device, it doesn't matter. Some applications are really, really uh, CPU intensive. Some of them are using the I/O devices more than the CPU. For example, a database application. All it does, for example, MySQL, right? All it does collects the request from the user, reads the database, and then gives that information read from the database. It doesn't do any calculations, right? It just reads the database. Of course, there are some you know, calculations involved in this part, but it's not really much if you compare with the data uh, exchange. So IO requests are more than the CPU requests, cycle requests in those kind of applications. So while you're uh, picking up your processes, you're gonna, sometimes you're gonna have to look at Okay, what kind of application? What kind of process is that? Is it I/O intensive? Is it, it requires a lot of I/O bursts or CPU bursts? It's going to be a part of the our uh, criteria choosing our algorithm. All right, because you cannot just pick one algorithm and then try to live with it. It's not really possible because algorithms are different. You know, different styles, different. It, it, they work differently with different burst types. Okay. Some of them will be really good at CPU bursting. Some of them will be really good at I/O. All right, depends on the application. So the operating system must be smart enough to pick the right algorithm. All right, who's going to do that? <coughs> As an operating system designer, you. <laughs> this video is really messy. Okay, he will just give you the idea.
Anyways, uh, for example, this is a process running in the CPU, all right? And it says load, store, add, store, read from file, that's a lot. And then um, it will have some CPU burst. And then it will try to read from the file. This is IO burst. And then the CPU will be idle at that time, you know, because, you know, while you're trying to read from the file, you have nothing to do with the CPU. All you do is read from the hard drive. By the way, um, you know how the hard drive works, right? I mean, roughly. You know, we have a controller card on the hard drive and we have the magnetic spinning uh, disk or we have the SSD stuff. But anyways, all you have to do is ask for data, request data, and then receive it. You know, the rest of the, you know, material stuff, the physics behind it will be handled by the controller, control card on the hard drive. So you have to wait for that. Uh, control card to respond to you and then after that there's another CPU burst there's another IO burst etc etc so your your CPU should be able to switch between the processes while you're waiting for the IO okay this is a, a regular single core and single threaded uh, CPU let's say and a burst looks like this on a graph. And uh, for example, time zero on the bottom, burst duration it says. Time zero, let's say you started your operating system or you just run, start running your application to Java or whatever. And all of a sudden, you request, request a lot of CPU cycles. You're trying to calculate things. And then tons of requests go to uh, the CPU. The CPU is pretty busy with your CPU bursts. So here the frequency of your bursts are 150, somewhere around that. And then all of a sudden, they probably there is an I request from your application, and then there's no more bursting CPUs. You know, there's no more CPU cycle requests from your application or from your process. So you will see. <coughs> Uh, some CPU scheduler uh, simulators later on I'll show you and in that one this is a really really simplified graph you will see tons of ups and downs on that uh, graphic All right. so what does a CPU scheduler do exactly selects from uh, pr uh, the ready queue which process will come first according to the algorithms all right we will talk about those algorithms later on and also uh, these four items called CPU scheduling decisions may take place when a process does this and does that these four items are important because you don't really have to sch uh, schedule your CPU all the time you know for some uh, specific situations you don't really have to do use your scheduler you don't have to use your dispatcher to organize you know to pick the right process from the ready queue specifically number one and four here it says if a process switches from running state to waiting state then you don't have to uh, run your CPU scheduler for the specific task because all you have to do is just put it in the queue you know there's no uh, brainy stuff there's no you know the calculation behind that and for number four too when a process terminates you don't have to do anything you don't have to you know kill yourself what to do with that process anymore you know because it's already done and all the stuff, CPU bursts, IO bursts are done and the process is ex uh, exiting. So you don't have to worry about that too. But number two and number three, switch, if a process switches from running to ready state, now you got to think. And also the same goes for if a process switches from waiting to ready, again you got to think. Why is that? Because now they are not running anymore you have to put them in the ready queue but how in what in which way what's the criteria all right 
Also, number one and four is called non preemptive. That means you know that all you have to do is uh, take care of these processes to put them in a queue or whatever, uh, or terminate it right away. But others are preemptive. That means while you're doing something with the CPU, okay, you had this process and it was running, and then all of a sudden it goes to ready state. At that specific moment, you might have you might need to pick another process from the ready queue and put it in the CPU and start making run. Ready state means that it is actually ready to run, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's, that process, it was running, it goes to ready queue. You're not just gonna pick it from the queue back to the CPU and run it again or continue running. You're not gonna do that. What you will do you will just look at your queue, looking for some specific criteria, and pick another one. Most likely another one. But if there's nothing else, if that is the only process in the queue, what are you going to do? You have to continue running the same thing, right? That is called preemptive. Preemptive means you're going to switch between uh, processes. You're going to decide what to do with the next <laughs> process, all right? That is preemptive. <clears throat> You remember the content switcher uh, from the process chapter four, process. Um, sorry, chapter three, processes, context switch. Right. Um, CPU scheduler has that too, because you have lots of queues, you have lots of stuff, and you're gonna pick the right thing, and you're gonna apply your algorithms, etc. It is simply called instead of uh, context uh, switch, simply called dispatcher. Sometimes. It takes time to decide which process to take from the ready queue. Right? You have many, many uh, processes in the ready queue. You have your algorithm. You're going to decide which one to pick. Maybe you're going to pick the one has system calls. Maybe you will pick the one with the IO bursts, etc. Somehow you're going to decide, right? There's a decision to make. And it takes time. How much time it takes? Not really uh, much, but it's about like roughly 100 mi microseconds. It's less than one millisecond, all right? So uh, dispatch, this, that waiting time while you're making your decision is called dispatch latency, dispatch latency. <clears throat> you don't need to worry about it very much, but you need to know. If there's something to do, it always takes time, all right? Sometimes it's super fast, sometimes it's really, you know, slow but it takes time okay so you need to know about that all right our criteria while uh, scheduling the processes in the CPU scheduling uh, operation let's say a couple of them are really important actually these are not uh, super absolute stuff but you know according to the researchers you know doing these operating designing those operating systems they look at the you know types of the processes. What do you do? And they come up with this list. They say you know what is most important for us uh, to make the decision is the CPU utilization. The other one is through output. Throughout okay, so you know what is a CPU utilization, right? You need to keep the busy all the time. Uh, keep the CPU busy all the time. If you right click on your taskbar on Windows and uh, status bar and then choose the taskbar, uh, task, what is that thing called? Task manager. task manager, right? And look at the CPU utilization. If you're running a, you know, uh, watching a movie or something or uh, running a rendering application, doing something really intensive, then your CPU load is going to go up. All right, it's going to go up to 80, 90, and in some cases it goes up to 100 percent. All right, but uh, in general, we're trying to keep them uh, keep the CPU 70 to 90 percent busy. All right, and also we uh, take care about we care about the through throughput, uh, which is the number of processes that complete their execution per time unit. 
which is actually similar to uh, keeping the busy, uh, CPU busy because you know how many processes you have complete in a uh, unit time a specific, a specific time unit all right that is important if it is high that means you're processing a lot of stuff in a you know short period of time that is good because you're keeping the CPU busy that is uh, it's almost the same thing but the trick is not all the processes are the same you know some of them requires a lot of CPU bursts some of them higher bursts so it gives you a rough idea statistical information along the way you can you know while you're testing your operating system you say okay if I choose this algorithm for my CPU scheduler the throughout uh, throughput is let's say 5 if I choose this one it is 20 wow that makes a lot of difference so this algorithm looks better all right because you can uh, process a lot more processes in a given time and of course as a developer if you write an application what do you do you test your application right with what sample data so uh, while you're doing this uh, operating design tests or you also need to use sample data otherwise everything will be random right if everything is random you could you can only uh, guess you can just assume things but uh, using the sample data which was which is chosen by you carefully will give you a better idea turnaround time another scheduling criteria it means the amount of time to execute a particular process that means a process is read from the ready queue loaded into the CPU that is your time zero and then you run the process time goes on and on and then at some point it is put back into the waiting queue and then read back etc and then that time goes again and after all the whole process time is called in and out without counting the waiting time for other processes is called turnaround time how about waiting time that's another scheduling criteria you know this is all about you know how are we going to design our algorithm okay uh, uh, the decision has to base on something right and uh, we're look, uh, look, looking at this stuff turnaround time throughput CPU utilization waiting time and response time to make the right decision to design our algorithms the waiting time is the amount of the time process has been waiting in the ready queue all right, you have a couple of processes. You will see examples here, and those examples are cool. <laughs> you might be uh, interested in them while you're studying. Anyways, uh, when you load a process into the CPU, what is its state? Running state. And then you run it for a while, and then there's an IO request, etc., and then you put that process back into the me memory main memory into the waiting queue because it's waiting for the IO right and then after a while it becomes ready I, I got what I want from the file and then we put that back into the ready queue until the CPU gets it back loads it back into the CPU registers and everything runs it and finishes it finish the uh, process right that waiting time inside that waiting queue is the uh, one process may be waiting multiple times you just for example you run it put it in the wait wait for the IO and then put it back in the CPU all of a sudden another IO request and then put it back in the waiting time etc multiple times you can put one process into the waiting queue doesn't matter IO, IO waiting queue or regular waiting queue so you just collect all those time for one specific process and it's going to be the total waiting time for this uh, process at the end all right and you will see in the algorithms later on there are other reasons other than IO uh, requests to make a process wait response time when you start running a uh, process the first time that process produces an output something that that, that time 
passed, start running, and then the first uh, response from that process, whatever milliseconds is that, is your response time. As you see, these are all specific to processes, right? Except for the one, uh, the first two. Any questions? No? It's, it's very straightforward, right? And we have a CPU and we, we want the operating system run really uh, smooth, you know, smoothly. Uh, we have user applications, we have operating system applications, server applications, etc. We just put them all into the CPU and expect that little guy to make it work properly, right? <laughs> That's why uh, we actually have the CPU scheduler. Anyways. All right. Now we're going to talk about the algorithms, but while we're doing that, what are we trying to accomplish by designing those algorithms? All right. Of course, obviously, we want to keep the CPU busy, right? Maximum CPU utilization. That is number one and the most important one uh, while we're designing our algorithms. The second one, the three output turn around time. Uh, you see that some of them, for some criteria, we are looking for the maximum. So for some of them, we're looking for the minimum. We don't want user wait for a long time. Let's say you're, you're just trying to log into a website, all right? You type your username, type your password, hit enter, never comes back. <laughs> it just says, you know, spinning, waiting, waiting for the server. Obviously, if you're smart enough, I mean, the browser writer, the the developer of the browser, the client, if he was or she was smart enough, uh, there was a timeout for it, right? I mean, uh, you, you're not expected to wait until, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes for it to log in. After a while, it will say, there's no response from the server, we can't do anything, you're not gonna be logged in. Anyways, we're trying to minimize the response time. It is very important. <coughs> I mean, like the others. <laughs> The whole thing is super important. Okay, we're gonna have some charts like this one on the screen. It's called Gantt chart for processes. You're gonna see a lot of these charts uh, for this chapter and later on. And also you'll have <coughs> an assignment about you know something similar to this one. So what we're trying to do, we have processes in hand, but these are uh, assumptions, right? I mean, we designed this test. This is a test. I mean, this is a test that we uh, we were trying to figure out how beautiful, how great our algorithm is. All right. So we have processes one, two, and three, and the burst time. When we say burst time, we're talking about the CPU burst. We're not talking about the I/O burst. We're talking about the CPU burst, and these are in milliseconds. All right. P1. If you load the P1 onto the CPU into the CPU, it's going to take 24 milliseconds to finish it up. The, that's uh, what it means, all right? For, for example, P2, it's gonna take only three milliseconds, it's super fast. P3 is uh, another small application, it will take three milliseconds to take uh, finish it up, okay? The first algorithm we, we, uh, we see here is first come, first serve, F, uh, FC, FS, all right? This is how it works. You got three processes and you're putting them in a queue and you're loading them into the CPU in a way that who comes first it will be in the first in the queue. We can simply use a queue for that, right? A regular data structure. We can use a ready queue simply implemented as a queue as, uh, as we saw in data structures. So P1 came first this is the uh, this is also the order they come into the CPU. P1, um, sorry, the ready queue. P1 came first, and this is the time starts at, from zero, and then it took 24 milliseconds to finish up with the P1. Okay. In the meantime, if there's a re request uh, by P1, we don't care about it. We just finish it. We start and finish. So, what do you think about this algorithm? Instead of 24 milliseconds, what if it was 2400 milliseconds? What would you do? 
and what's the uh, what's the outcome of this uh, burst time for P1? If it was 2,400 milliseconds, the other processes has to wait for a long time, right? Because uh, that is why actually this is the simplest uh, way to implement uh, or. Uh, yeah, way to implement the CPU scheduling. This is not really a good one, but it will be used for some other purposes. Anyways, P1 comes and we run the P1 in the CPU and then eventually it will exit. And then in the ready queue we have P2. Uh, it takes only three milliseconds. The time was 24 milliseconds, right? And then we added two, three milliseconds more to finish it up and then it, uh, the time moved up to 27 and then P3 started at 27 millisecond and then it took three more milliseconds to finish it up. So waiting time, what is the waiting time for P1, P2 and P3? In this algorithm, in this algorithm design, P1 has no waiting time because it was the first one. All right, first come, first serve, remember? So uh, it's zero. For P2, P2 has to wait for P1 to finish it up, right? So we have to wait 24 milliseconds, which is P1's uh, burst time. And P3 also has to wait for P1 and P2, because it was the last guy that came into the AQ. We added. That is the waiting time for each processes and the average waiting time, just collect them all together, how many processes you have, three of them and divide by three, that is the average. Okay. So while we're calculating this stuff, we want to see how efficient our algorithms. There are of course other ways to or, uh, figure out how good an algorithm is, but this is another way uh, to make us you know, uh, understand the subject better. If you remember from your data structure, the very well known uh, measurements uh, way for algorithms is, remember? Big O notation, right? It is the complexity of an algorithm. You know how complex is that? Uh, and also it will give you an idea how long it's gonna take to finish up that algorithm, specific algorithm, anyways. And there's another example, I guess. Suppose the process are right. okay. Now we're using the same algorithm, right? First come, first serve. But this time we're just changing the order. What happens if you change the order? Is anything will be changed or not? The total time, the everything, the average waiting time, etc. Waiting time for each process specifically will be changed, of course, because the order is not the same anymore, but the average waiting time, what happens to that one? Okay, let's go back. The before the average waiting time, 17 with P1, 2, and 3, and now, wait, I cannot, what? Oh. Yeah, there was a thread waiting in the CPU, <laughs> keeping the CPU busy. Now it's just three milliseconds. If you compare 17 to three, what do you see? So it depends on the order of the processes and the burst time of each process. The efficiency of the algorithm is not fixed. It is variable, all right? It depends on uh, the burst time and the order. So if you look at the other one, we had to wait 17 milliseconds to run P2 and P3, which is also called Conway effect because we had the long P1 stuck the, the traffic, right? You know, if you're on the highway, uh, you know, I don't know if you have uh, interstate traveling, it, it happens a lot, you know, there's a huge uh, whatever bus or whatever keeps the road busy and you cannot pass through because it's two ways only you know you don't have multiple lanes it's a problem anyways this is called first come first serves all right any questions about this uh, algorithm and you can simply use a Q data structure to put your uh, processes PCBs in the memory okay and there's another one. 
shortest job first scheduling. So in this one, if you remember from the first one, there was a huge uh, burst with uh, P1. And what they thought, you know, instead of waiting for the big guy, why we're not just running the little ones and then get to know them easily, you know, fa because it's faster? Uh, let's try this way. And uh, they look at the CP burst time and then put them in the queue in a way that, you know, they're ordered uh, by the CP burst time and then run them accordingly or just put them uh, in a way into the queue so that they can pick up with the smallest first or shortest first from the queue. It looks very optimal if you just compare with the first come first served. By the way, what time is it? Oh, okay, it's almost uh, 45 minutes past. You know the average time for a student, you know, globally, uh, according to the statistics, to keep your mind focused is 40 minutes. Yeah. So if you want to give a break, I can understand. <laughs> All right, let's do that one too and then to, uh, give a break. Example, short, uh, shortest uh, job first uh, algorithm. All right, this is the second algorithm. So again, we have multiple processes and uh, their birth time is given and we need to create that gun chart first, but while we are doing, we have to think. We have to apply this algorithm, okay? First of all, just look at these burst times. P1, 6, P2, 8, P3, 7, P4, 3. So we have to start with P4 because the algorithm tells me that I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the shortest one, right? And then we put the P4 here, and then while uh, it's running, there is nothing uh, to worry about. After that, we're gonna run the second one in order. Which one is the shortest one after that? P1, okay? Starts at uh, uh, third millisecond and then keeps up six milliseconds more, which means three plus six is equal to nine. And then after that, we have P3. As you see, do you see the problem with this algorithm again? Uh, the same problem with the FCFS. Uh, you know, you had to wait for a process until it finished. You know, you cannot switch between them. That is again a problem, but it, this is better than the first come first per, uh, serve because you're just taking care of the uh, you know short ones, the quick ones first, so that you can just. Uh, utilize the CPU better. You don't have to wait for long processes, all right, to process that thing. How about the average waiting time? Okay, tell me the waiting uh, waiting time for each processes, which is not written here. What is the waiting uh, time for P4? Zero. Zero, because it has the uh, it smallest burst time. It came, uh, it, it, it was running the CPU at first, for P1, it has to wait for P4, three milliseconds, and for P3, has to wait 12 minutes. All right, what is that 16 right away? Wait, 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 this, uh, we don't, we cannot add these two, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is zero to nine, so uh, just add nine uh, for P3. For P2, we have to wait 16 uh, milliseconds, so divided by four, the average is seven. Okay, can you calculate the average time if we have used first came first served algorithm instead of SJF, shortest job first? Can you do that? Average time? Yes, average time, waiting time for each process and average time in total by using the first come first cert. Got a question? Okay, we're not gonna change the order as we did in the shortest job first because you know it's first come first cert, right? We're not gonna change anything. We, we will just add them together. P, P1 goes first, it takes six uh, milliseconds and then it, uh, P2 goes eight milliseconds, P3, seven, and P4, three. So what is the average waiting time? We just need, for P2 average time, six. 
for P3 average waiting time is 8 because you know it has to wait for P1 and P2 for P4 average time is 7 so 6, 7, 8 and 7 15, 21 is it? Right, 21 divided by 4? 24. 24 by, okay, whatever, 24 divided by 5, what is the result? 6. 6 is smaller or larger than this one? Oh my God, it doesn't make sense. Why? Because, you know, we were saying that first come, first serve is not really a good one. This is better, this algorithm SJF is better because, you know, you can get to the quickest one, etc., etc., etc. But, in this order, P1, 2, 3, 4, it looks like, you know, this is slower than the first one. SJF is slower than the FCFS. But if you change the order, you will see that things are changing again. You know, if you remember from the first one, it was taking 3 milliseconds with 2, 3, 1 order and 17 milliseconds with the 1, 2, 3 order. If you check this one again, you know, it's going to be different. Anyways, all right. Uh, Let's give a break for 10 minutes. It's what time is it? It's 2. Come back at 2:10.